Uh, All right. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, for joining. Um, uh, it's this is Bipler Shivasto, and uh, it's a distinct pleasure to have uh, Ramashish Gaurav, who is a PhD student uh, at uh, Virginia Tech, talking today about neuromorphic computing. Uh, Ramashish has a bachelor's from IIT BHU and, and a master's, sorry, integrated master's and uh, BTEC from uh, IIT BHU. Uh, he also did his master's from University of Waterloo and uh, he joined uh, the PhD program here. Uh, he's a prodigious uh, person uh, with a lot of work in different aspects of computing, including machine learning. Uh, in uh, he, he and I did uh, work in uh, train uh, delay prediction together. He had uh, worked in a small company in Nutanix in uh, India, in Bangalore. And then uh, he was e extremely interested in uh, neuromorphic computing um, uh, four to five years back. And he has been really, um, he's, he's the kind of person you would really like to have in a PhD student, full of initiative and trying to push boundaries. So without too much ado, I want to hear what Ramashish is up to. And uh, uh, really, if uh, there are things which we can actually do um, at the at the lab, at the institute, at the college, and uh, uh, that would be terrific. So, Ramashish, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to Professor Bepler Slevasa for uh, for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, uh, it's a privilege for me to be here among you people. Uh, among you experts of uh, in, in varying domain, in, in various AI domain. Uh, so uh, welcome to my talk on neuromorphic computing. Uh, you can call me Ram. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech uh, and uh, I'm, I'm part of Mix group and my supervisor is uh, Professor Yang Ye. Okay, without further ado, let's uh, start with uh, the uh, overview of this talk. So I'll start with an introduction to neuromorphic computing, uh, followed by a short introduction to spiking neurons, and then I'll explain its relation to artificial neurons. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, spiking neural networks, uh, where I'll focus on training of SNNs, uh, recent progress in SNNs, uh, and also, uh, if time permits, my work with SNNs. Then I'll uh, talk about neuromorphic computing hardware and the energy efficiency offered by them. Uh, followed by conclusion and, of course, future directions. Okay, so neuromorphic computing, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a domain in AI which is uh, neurobiologically inspired, similar to the ANNs. Uh, uh, it's, th there are some differences which I'll talk about later as well, and is based on the uh, microscopic physiological computations in the brain. Uh, in short, it is everything hardware and software about the spiking neurons. Uh, the software part uh, consists of architectures built with spiking neurons and the related algorithms. Uh, uh, and the hardware part uh, consists of uh, specialized computational chips, uh, which efficiently deploy such models in an uh, energy efficient manner. Uh, my research is focused more on the software aspects of uh, neuromorphic computing, uh, especially on the training of uh, spiking neural networks. Uh, coming to spiking neurons, uh, they are the fundamental units of neuromorphic computing. Uh, you can think of them as uh, an electrical abstraction of uh, biological neurons, uh, which generate action potentials. The action potentials are what we call informally as spikes and uh, hence the name spiking neurons. Uh, what is an action potential? Uh, so uh, let's uh, look at this picture and uh, consider it to be representative of the uh, physiological environment uh, of a neuron cell in the brain. So uh, the blue line, which you are seeing here uh, is the cell membrane. Uh, and uh, internal to the cell membrane, we have uh, uh, some concentration of ions and external to the cell membrane or external to the cell, uh, also we have some concentration of ions. These uh, uh, cylindrical structures, which are uh, uh, horizontally cutting the uh, uh, cell membrane are called uh, ionic channels or ion gates through which these ions can uh, move in and out of the uh, intercellular en environment and the extracellular environment. Uh, at the resting state, when the neuron is not active, when the neuron cell is not active, uh, uh, these ch uh, channels are not opened and, and no, uh, no flow of ions is there. So uh, uh, 
uh, uh, so due to the difference in the concentration of ions in the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment, uh, there is a uh, resultant uh, membrane potential, or, or it gives rise to a change. In, uh, sorry, it gives, it gives to rise to a change. Uh, sorry, uh, it gives uh, it gives rise to uh, a potential difference uh, in the uh, intracellular environment and the extracellular environment. So uh, when such a neuron is uh, stimulated, uh, these ion channels uh, tend to open up and uh, uh, there is a flow of ions from outside to inside and from inter, uh, intracellular environment, sorry, in, intracellular environment to extracellular uh, environment. Now this change, uh, or sorry, uh, this flow of ions across the uh, cell membrane uh, changes uh, the membrane potential, which was at resting state, which, which we may call resting potential, but now here it is getting changed. Uh, and if the change uh, is positive enough, uh, uh, so that it crosses a certain threshold, uh, then that gives rise to a, uh, a wave of change in the ionic concentration across uh, the uh, across the exon of, uh, exon of the uh, cell, the neuron cell. So pictorially, we can uh, understand exon potential uh, as such. Uh, so on the x-axis, you have your uh, time steps, which is in millisecond. And uh, on the y-axis, you have your uh, membrane potential in millivolts. So at the resting state, uh, there is, uh, at this state, uh, when the neuron is not active, uh, the cell membrane, uh, the membrane potential is at minus 70 millivolt. And whenever uh, there is an uh, arrival of an EPSP, which stands for uh, excitatory uh, postsynaptic potential, the membrane potential tends to rise. And if there is sufficient excitation and it reaches a threshold, then it overshoots. And this uh, overshoot is what we call uh, action potential. So uh, going ahead uh, uh, to the electrical and uh, mathematical modeling of the uh, neurons. So, uh, 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 we need to model the dynamics of the ion flow or the electrochemical gradients, mm -hmm. but that is quite difficult. Uh, the, uh, certain approximations are necessary. For example, the uh, lipid layer uh, is approximated as the membrane capacitance, and the ionic channels are approximated as uh, electrical conductance, and the electrical uh, electrochemical gradients as voltage source. So let's talk about the equations which uh, which model such uh, such uh, physiological uh, process in a, in a neuron cell. Uh, the first attempt to do so, uh, the first successful attempt to do so was in 1952, and, and that led to uh, the creation of this uh, hodgkin huxley neuron model. It is quite detailed, and uh, it accounts for the spatial and temporal aspects of the, uh, of the uh, biological neuron. Uh, and of course, uh, it is computationally intensive because, of course, it, uh, it accounts for both the spatial and temporal aspects. Uh, Another uh, neuron model, which is uh, quite famous uh, or quite uh, commonly used in uh, spiking neural networks is leaky integrated and fire neuron model. Uh, this is the equation for it. Uh, you have the C as a, a membrane capacitance, V as the membrane voltage, uh, I is the input current to it, and one over R is uh, the conductance. Uh, another uh, spiking neuron model is uh, leaky, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the integrated and fire neuron model. In fact, it is the simplest uh, neuron model, the spiking neuron model. This is its equation, and uh, it's pretty similar to this, except that there's an absence of this term, which implies that uh, uh, this uh, neuron model uh, does not uh, leak uh, voltage. I mean to say, uh, the, the voltage does not decay in this uh, if uh, neuron model, but in the left neuron model, the voltage decays with time. Uh, one more uh, point to note is that LIF and IF neuron models, they are uh, uh, they're also uh, called as point neuron models uh, because they only uh, model the generation of a spike or the generation of action potential, but not the propagation of action potential through the exon of the neuron. Great. So uh, let's briefly talk about the relation of uh, spiking neurons to artificial neurons. So the artificial neurons are highly abstracted out. Um, they do not model action potentials or spikes. They do not account for uh, temporality or spatiality, and they are stateless. Uh, the artificial neurons uh, are simple nonlinear uh, activation functions. For example, Relu sigmoid, which of course all of us are familiar with. Uh, they output real values, uh, real continuous values, and the real valued output of artificial neurons can be considered analogous to the firing rate of spiking neurons. 
So what do I mean by firing rate or spiking neurons? So if you happen to simulate uh, an integrated fire neuron model or uh, leaky integrated fire neuron model, uh, and, and you Im Im implement that and uh, input uh, a fixed uh, value uh, uh, for a duration of one second, for example, uh, then the number of spikes it generates in that duration of one second is what we call uh, firing rate. For example, if uh, the F neuron is fed some input and it generates uh, 40, uh, 40 spikes in one second, then the firing rate is 40 hertz. If a larger magnitude input is given to it, uh, and that's constant for one uh, for one second duration, and it produces, for example, 150 spikes, then we'll say the F neuron is firing at 150 hertz. Great. So uh, to understand it pictorially, uh, let's let's view this figure. Uh, on the uh, on the left hand side, uh, this this plot is obtained from the uh, from a spiking neuron. Uh, it, it, it is a leaky integrated fire neuron model. And on the middle and on the right-hand side, these two plots are obtained uh, from the activation functions uh, from of, of the artificial neurons. So, uh, this is a sigmoid activation function, and this is for the radio activation function. So uh, on the x-axis, you have the input current, and on the y-axis, you have the firing rate. So if you happen to feed some input current here, uh, then uh, this uh, neuron, this leaky integrant fire neuron model, spikes uh, at 50 hertz if, if you feed uh, input current of magnitudes, let's suppose eight units, it spikes at uh, close to 175 hertz. So, uh, sorry, uh, I think 200 hertz, yeah. So uh, uh, varying the, uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, the, the curvature of this uh, plot, uh, of, this, uh, of this curve is actually quite similar to uh, that of the sigmoid activation function and the railway activation function. In fact, you can tune the parameters of this leaky integrated fire neuron model to make it resemble more like sigmoid, and even you can tune it to resemble more like uh, ReLU activation function. So the firing rate is, uh, is what uh, you can understand the output of the artificial neurons. Great. Going ahead to spiking neural networks, uh, the SNNs and ANNs generally share the same conventional architectures. They are built with uh, dense layers. They are also built with uh, convolutional layers, but there are certain differences to it. Uh, so instead of these stateless artificial neurons, uh, we use stateful spiking neurons in the SNNs. And unlike the artificial neurons, which output real valued uh, outputs, uh, real continuous value, uh, these spiking neurons output binary spikes. Uh, uh, could be zero and one. Sometimes uh, we also have spiking networks with graded spikes too. That is, they have a magnitude attached to the spikes, not just zeros and ones. It could be zero, two, zero, two, zero, four, something like that. The assonance are inherently temporal in nature, just by the uh, because of the virtue of uh, spiking neurons. Uh, and uh, here is a uh, short video of uh, of an uh, of an SNN in action. Uh, these are the input spiking neurons, and we have this output spiking neurons. You will see the spikes coming in to these input spiking neurons, and if they get sufficiently activated, they will transfer. Uh, they, they will generate spikes, and uh, it will transfer. It will get trans. Uh, it will. It will be transferred to this. Uh, uh, to this spiking uh, uh, neuron, and if this gets sufficiently activated, then it will output spike too. Let's see it in action. The spikes are coming in. They get activated and. Eventually, this neuron output spike as well. The idea is to deploy such a spiking neural network on your morphic chip so that it offers the energy efficiency uh, compared to the existing uh, uh, NNR uh, uh, deployments on GPUs and FPGAs. Great. So uh, let's look into the discretized equations. The equations of uh, spiking neurons, which I showed you earlier, are in continuous time domain. But if you happen to implement it in, uh, it in uh, if you happen to implement it uh, in an uh, SNN, how do you do that? So uh, for the left neuron, uh, this is how you model the current. Uh, so uh, I subscript N superscript N denotes uh, uh, that uh, the current uh, of neuron I uh, in the layer N. Uh, S here, uh, S subscript J superscript N minus one denotes the spikes of the layer, uh, uh, spikes of the, uh, in, uh, of the neuron J from the previous layer N minus one. So, uh, it's, it's, it's quite easy to follow. The spikes on the previous layer are multiplied to the weights and added to the previous current value. Uh, D, uh, and alpha here is a decay constant, so it's a decayed current. Uh, alpha is uh, generally said to be less than one. Uh, here uh, we have the uh, equation for the membrane potential. It's quite similar uh, to this, uh, the, to the above one. Uh, it, it also uses the previous uh, uh, membrane potential of the uh, uh, 
uh, of the in, uh, spike in neuron here. I forgot this that this t is here uh, just time time steps. So uh, here beta uh, beta is your uh, voltage decay constant. It is also kept less than one. Uh, this function here a spiking uh, is a spiking function uh, where theta is your uh, heavy side step function. The argument to it is uh, the membrane potential of the ith neuron uh, minus uh, the voltage threshold. So if this value the argument to this theta function is uh, more than zero, then the output is uh, a one a value of one. And if it is not, then the output is zero. It's just like heavy side step function. Coming to the if neurons, uh, the, the current equation is uh, exactly the same as uh, left neuron. Uh, the, uh, uh, the voltage equation is quite different than the uh, left neuron uh, in the sense that we do not have this uh, voltage decay constant here beta. So that means the voltage here does not decay with time. Here, a decayed voltage was taken into consideration. Here, the voltage does not decay with time. Uh, the spiking function remains the same. Uh, as I said, alpha and beta, uh, alpha and beta are uh, decay constants. They are in range zero to one. Generally, uh, they're, th they're kept in the range zero to one. Theta is your heavy side step function, and V threshold, uh, V three is your threshold. So, uh, one thing to remember is that uh, once the neuron spikes, that is, uh, once the argument to uh, if the argument to this theta function is more than zero and the output is one then the voltage uh, is reset, uh, voltage of the ith neuron in the nth layer, that particular neuron, voltage is reset to zero after spiking. Moving uh, ahead to training of SNMs. Uh, you see, training of SNMs is not trivial. Uh, back propagation, which is uh, the workhorse, uh, workhorse for uh, ANNs is not natively applicable here. Mm -hmm. Why so? Uh, because of the inherent temporal nature of SNMs and because of the uh, non-differentiable heavy side step function. Uh, so uh, this is a spiking function, if you, if you remember from the previous slide. And if you happen to take its derivative with respect to V, uh, then it outputs uh, a Dirac delta function, which is uh, zero everywhere, except at argument zero at which it is infinite. You may ask that why do we need to take the derivative of the spiking function? Well, if you try to uh, apply back propagation based methods to train SNMs, then you have then you need to take the derivative of the spikes with respect to its argument uh, that is v uh, pictorially it can be understood as uh, as such so you have this heavy side step function uh, so uh, standard function heavy side uh, and uh, if you take its derivative then everywhere along this negative axis it's all uh, zero and everywhere along the positive uh, number line is also zero except at uh, argument zero where it is ill-defined or infinite. So that's the problem uh, while training uh, SNNs. So uh, there are a number of uh, solutions proposed to train SNNs. I'm familiar with uh, two of them, uh, worked on them. So I'll be presenting those two. The first is a conversion from a pre-trained ANN to an SNN, uh, also known as the ANN to SNN conversion method. The second one is uh, by using the surrogate derivatives of uh, of the spiking function, uh, this theta, we need uh, this this direct delta function. We need to have uh, what people do is uh, they just take uh, surrogate derivatives of this, which I'll explain later, and this is also known as uh, surrogate gradient descent method. Uh, coming to ANN to SNN conversion method, the idea is to first train an ANN using conventional backpropagation algorithm, and then replace those artificial neurons, which is uh, for example relu neurons, with spiking neurons, for example if neurons. Uh, and to the other uh, necessary necessary uh, network uh, parameter modifications, for example, uh, scaling of the weights or uh, changing the bias values. These uh, modifications and the replacement of uh, artificial neurons with spike neurons can be done through libraries like LangoDL, SNN Toolbox, NX, uh, TF, etc. Uh, talking about surrogate gradient descent method, the second method to train SNS. So this is this is in fact the direct training method of SNS. Uh, where we need to approximate the derivative of uh, del, uh, of the spiking function, uh, uh, which is the direct delta function through surrogate functions. Uh, once we do that, we can use the backpropagation through time uh, to backpropagate the error gradients, and it works beautifully, but suffers from the vanishing gradient problem for uh, training deep SNS. So here uh, in this picture, you can see uh, that this dotted line here is the direct delta function. On the x-axis, you have memory potential u, and in the y-axis, you have the derivative value. So this 
Dirac data function just shoots to infinity and uh, here it just remains uh, zero all the time except that. So this uh, Dirac data function is being approximated by these uh, curves, which are in uh, green, orange, and blue, uh, which retains some properties of the Dirac data function so that it rises and then it falls down. So by the usage of such uh, surrogate derivatives, you can train the uh, SNNs uh, using backpropagation, back backpropagation through time uh, algorithm. Uh, Ram? Yes. A couple of quick questions on the previous slide, if I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. please professor. The first question is, is it always the case that uh, for every ANN, there is an SNN and for every SNN, there is an ANN? Oh. That's an ex, uh, that's an interesting question. So I would say, uh, in 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 my limited research experience so far, I would say for every ANN you should be able to have an SNN, uh, but for every SNN, uh, I would say probably not. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll I'll talk more about this later, and you might get more context about uh, what I'm trying to convey here. Okay. The second question is, if we are trying to train an SNN. Why even consider an ANN? Like this ANN to SNN conversion assumes that you're building an ANN, right? That's so correct. why even go there? Uh, so if, do people actually, whenever they're training SNNs, do they consider ANN or they just, uh, what are the cases in which they consider ANN? Let me just ask that way. Okay, uh, so for training deep neural networks, for training deep SNNs, ANN to SNN conversion method is successful. As I, as I just, as you can see in the slide, this current slide, in fact, uh, uh, if you use surrogate derivatives, you will suffer with vanishing gradient problem. But that doesn't have, but that can be taken care in the ANN domain quite easily. And so if you happen to train a uh, deep SNN, if, if, if you need deep SNNs, then first of all, train an ANN counterpart, an isomorphic ANN, and then convert it to SNN. In those cases, I believe ANN to SNN conversion method is successful. In fact, a number of works are there on ANN to SNN conversion method compared to the surrogate gradient reason method. Okay, thank you. The problem. Okay, uh, going ahead, uh, let's uh, talk about the recent progress in SNNs. Uh, so uh, following works are of course not exhaustive, but they do show the progress of uh, SNNs in a variety of AI domains. Uh, sorry, I think something happened here. Yes. So, uh, I'll start with the SPAWN, which stands for uh, Semantic Pointer Architecture Unified Network. It is a uh, sample brain model of 2.5 million spiking neurons, uh, which is capable of wisdom. Uh, uh, for example, digital recognition. Uh, it is capable of reasoning and pattern recognition. It's capable of also uh, having some memory of uh, the uh, digits, the input digits, and also of motor response. Uh, in the image classification domain, uh, with the static images, uh, for example, CFAR10 and ImageNet dataset, the SNNs have achieved 93.5% and 70% accuracy, respectively. And on the uh, even-based images, uh, I, I'm assuming this is a different kind of, uh, uh, a few of the guys might not be familiar with uh, even-based images. I'll, I'll talk about them a bit later. Uh, we have 77.10% and 97.5% accuracy on DVS CFAR10 and DVS128 gesture dataset. Uh, with respect to time series classification, uh, uh, there have been attempts made for deploying spiking versions of LSTM as a wide computing on Lohihi neuromorphic hardware. And uh, with respect to spiking GANs, uh, there, are, there have been some experiments on MNIST and UCI digits as well. Uh, with respect, uh, we even have uh, a spike GPT model, which is, uh, this is a, in fact, a, a recent work. Uh, it was brought into my con uh, context by Professor Srivastava. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, where the authors uh, introduced uh, three different models of uh, uh, spike GPT uh, network uh, of 45 million parameters, 25 million parameters, and 260 million parameters. They claim that uh, this is one of the largest uh, spiking networks uh, developed uh, till date. And in fact, it does a good job of text generation as well. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, let's look into some canonical works here uh, with SNMs. So I'm just image uh, classification with SNMs and see how, how things uh, uh, dive a bit deeper to see how things actually uh, work with SNMs. So uh, similar to the ANS case, um, MNIST is one of the most experimented data sets. Uh, be it an to SNN conversion or the surrogate gradient decent method, one has to import the pixels to spikes. Now these, uh, 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 this, this uh, encoding of pixels to spikes can be done via rate or Poisson encoding, 
um, and also uh, with interspike interval or time to versus spike encoding methods. So the encoding methods determine how efficiently you feed info to the SNN. That means how rich your information uh, content, what you feed uh, to the SNN is. The richer the information content, uh, better the performance of the SNN. So the encoding methods are uh, uh, really important. Uh, Amnest is quite simple, and it doesn't really bring out uh, the differences in the methods. Uh, with respect to convolutional SNNs, uh, we have a problem with max pooling. Max pooling with spike neurons is challenging. Um, uh, it's, it's not uh, easily doable. Average pooling is not. So, uh, and uh, if if and if you're, uh, you should also look into your SNN that if all of the neurons are uh, spiking every time step, and uh, that that doesn't offer the sparsity of spiking. So maybe regularizing firing rates uh, would be would be uh, a viable solution to lower down the firing uh, of uh, spiking neurons. Uh, then uh, now uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk about the DBS one twenty eight just a classification with SNN. So as as I said, uh, this is an event based uh, data set. Uh, what I mean, uh, so, so so this is uh, a just a classification data set which is captured by a specific type of camera, which is uh, which falls into the class of event cam event based cameras. Uh, it's from the uh, Ini Labs called DBS one twenty eight camera. Uh, so what they do is uh, instead of uh, capturing the pixels intensity, they, they tend to capture the changes in the intensities. So it's like a moving image uh, uh, in time and uh, slightly it's just like, uh, like a saccadic movement of the uh, eyeball sort of stuff. So uh, that's how the changes in the intensities are captured. And uh, this dynamic vision sensor, which is uh, uh, DBS, uh, uh, it generates events whenever a pixel value changes. I have not worked with this data set, but I think this data set is already encoded in spikes and uh, SNS developed with convolutional networks, they have performed really well uh, on, on such a uh, data set. Uh, okay, uh, coming to my work on uh, uh, SNS, I'll be very quick here. I was working uh, in my master's, I was working on driving scene understanding where the goal was to build uh, a spiking scene in for video recognition or classification. And there I used the NNT conversion method to train a sample uh, C3D model. Uh, I also worked on max pooling in, in CNN. So the max pooling is a nonlinear operation. And uh, how do we do max pooling with spikes? Do you simply uh, take the max of incoming spikes in a pooling region? Uh, th that actually does not produce a true max value. So uh, I was able to uh, design two uh, spiking networks to approximate max pooling in CNNs. And also uh, those spiking networks were deployable on a neuromorphic hardware. I've also worked on time uh, series classification domain uh, where I uh, and and uh, where my work was in spiking as a word computing on Lohihi. Uh, Lohihi is a neuromorphic hardware, which I'll talk later. Uh, so the goal was to build a reservoir computing based uh, energy efficient time series classification model. And I designed a uh, spiking reservoir computing network based on the Alexander Delim network. Uh, and uh, another network uh, which I uh, developed, which is my latest work, is Lazandre Spiking Neural Network. Uh, so the problem was that the performance of my previous uh, model was quite poor. So how do we improve it? Uh, so uh, I designed it as a wire based spiking neural network uh, using the surrogate gradient decent method, and it actually uh, proved to be quite useful. Uh, it, it did improve the accuracy. Uh, so why do we have uh, uh, SNNs when the ANNs are already uh, the state of the art? Well, because of the energy efficiency offered by the SNS, uh, the spiking neuron the neurons transmit spike only when required, uh, and that's uh, that way they are energy efficient. So uh, let's briefly talk about neuromorphic computing hardware. Uh, executing SNS on CPUs or GPUs isn't energy efficient. Uh, we need specialized neuromorphic hardware, which can be digital or analog, to uh, execute the uh, spike networks. Uh, for example, Intel's Lohihi uh, version one and two, IBM's TrueNorth, SpinNicker version one and two, or the, uh, the range uh, neuromorphic uh, processing unit. Uh, neuromorphic chips actually provide circuit support for spiking neurons. For example, the current based model, which is Cuba uh, on Lohihi. And in fact, uh, uh, they also provide support for transmission of um, spikes and other, other, necessary uh, other necessary hardware support for efficiently deploying spiking neural networks. Uh, let's uh, look into the examples of energy efficiency on Intel's Lohihi neuromorphic hardware. Uh, for, for the keyword spotting task, the authors found that it takes 29.8 millijoules on GPU, but just 0.27 millijoules on Lohihi. 
followed by that uh, uh, for the image segmentation task. It takes uh, 30 millijoules on GPU, uh, but it took just 10 millijoules on Lohi. Uh, so uh, coming to the image retrieval task, uh, the authors found that it takes 37.4 millijoules on GPU, but just takes 3.0 millijoules on Lohi. Uh, classifying order samples, this is uh, the work from Intel. It took less than one millijoule on Lohi. Uh, and, uh, and the prediction was made in less than three milliseconds of time. Coming to the conclusion of future work, uh, we, we saw that the SNS are built with spiking neurons, which transmit spikes. Uh, they can be binary or rated. Uh, we also saw that the SNS are inherently temporal, which implies that they are best suited for online AI tasks. The SNS are also energy efficient, uh, which implies that neuromorphic computing is highly suited for edge deployments, IoT devices, or energy constrained systems. For example, battery powered robots or autonomous vehicles. Currently, the SNS are riding on the success of ANS. So, this is where Professor uh, Srivastava would like to uh, bring your uh, inter, uh, attention here that uh, the network architectures remain the same. Uh, and uh, we also use the same, uh, similar training methodology, for example, the propagation of error training. Uh, and that's why I said uh, that uh, the SN. Uh, in most cases, an ANN does have its uh, counterpart in the SNN domain. Uh, we have few uh, emerging methods to train SNNs as well, which is, uh, for example, the three-factor rule-based learning. Uh, this is a uh, local learning rule, uh, and it makes use of the pre- and post-synaptic terms, for example, uh, which are in uh, Habian learning. Uh, it's also fav uh, favorable for hardware deployment or implementation, and, and it's biologically motiv motivated as well. Uh, uh, I would like to just end with uh, this fact that the brain consumes 20 watts of power, our brain just 20 watts, uh, and state-of-the-art SNNs and neuromorphic computing hardware are still far from it, but I hope we get to it someday. Uh, uh, I thank my uh, previous supervisors, Professor Brian Tiff and Professor Kuranarayan for the work done in, during my master's at the Institute of Waterloo, and Dr. Tennessee Stewart and my supervisor, Professor Yang Yi, for uh, my current PhD work at Virginia Tech here and all my former and current lab mates uh, for their fruitful discussions. And once again, my special thanks to Professor Dr. Srivasa for inviting me to hold this talk. Uh, that's it, I, I end my talk, and thank you. Thanks, Ram. Uh, there are a few questions in chat, and uh, then there are some uh, follow-up questions. So if you want to just look at the chat, please. Yes. And Kaushik, do you want to ask your question? I can see um, I mean, uh, okay. Uh, I uh, my voice may sound a little uh, low, but I'll ask. So the first question is: uh, uh, so they, in machine learning, when you cannot do gradient descent, uh, you do alternatives like uh, you can change your neurons to uh, admit uh, complex valued inputs and emit uh, the phases, right? And that way, uh, you can skip back propagation when training the network or you could uh, use uh, functional derivatives so the spike you can think of it as a function and you don't care about the parameters that affect the spike anymore you only care about the difference between the spike output and your, the ultimate ground truth and you only train uh, your network to minimize that difference and the parameters can actually be completely random and uh, th those networks are also universal approximators. So um, that was the first question if those traditional alternatives that I know from uh, ANN literature have been tried. Um, yeah, so the second one is unrelated. So maybe I'll, I'll ask that afterwards. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you for bringing this point uh, to, to my attention. I do not know about, uh, I, in fact, I did not know about these methods that you talked about uh, where you take the difference of the events uh, happening, uh, and then that can be used as spike neurons. I have not, uh, in my research so far, I have not seen any literature on this. Uh, maybe because I was, I'm, I'm biased towards uh, the current, uh, like like my methods of training SNs. Uh, the traditional methods of ANNs uh, to train, sorry, to train ANNs uh, uh, have been very much explored in the SNN domain, but. I'm, I'm assuming that the method that you told me is quite novel, probably, uh, which I do not, I have no idea. Uh, okay, uh, the, the, the reason those came up to my mind is that they're not traditionally discussed in Indian literature either. But ah. usually when you encounter situations where 
you have uh, activations that uh, don't have uh, derivatives. These are hacks people have tried and they work. So I was just curious. Um, the second question uh, that I had was uh, you showed comparison between um, mm, uh, the efficiency of spike and neuromorphic hardware versus GPUs. Uh, but the standard right now in the industry and in large production systems is uh, to distribute neural processing across TPUs and they're actually uh, orders of magnitude faster. So I was wondering if you had numbers on that. Uh, that that's a uh, ex excellent question actually. So uh, uh, with respect to uh, the number, uh, a number of papers which I've gone through, they, they mostly talk about uh, energy, uh, their en energy consumption on GPUs. They do not talk about TPUs, but I, but I myself had this question and I, and I looked for uh, papers on TPUs versus Lohihi. Uh, and it came to me, to my surprise, that GPUs are performing better uh, than the existing uh, Lohihi neuromorphic hardware. But there are a few things to consider. Uh, the TPU is all, already uh, an industry standard and uh, Lohihi neuromorphic hardware, it's not even in market yet. It's still a research chip, and uh, uh, the people, uh, I mean, the, the researchers have uh, uh, pointed out a variety of bottlenecks uh, through which energy efficiency and Louis can be improving yeah. even further. But uh, I would also like to point out uh, that this Louis neuromorphic chip is a digital neuromorphic chip. If you go into analog domain, uh, uh, the papers talk about them that uh, they will be even. Uh, more efficient than digital neuromorphic chips. In fact, uh, 1000 energy efficiency, perhaps I think they do not mention com compared to what, but I think they're just talking about with respect to AN and so on GPUs or well with GPUs as well. Uh, in short, uh, Lohihi is still in research phase, uh, but it's getting close to the TPUs. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you for your questions. Uh, any other questions? And I would encourage you, if people have uh, other questions, let me please feel free to ask. Maybe I would just be curious uh, to hear you talk more about um, where do you want to go from there? What's, what's your future objective? So, um, because you reached out uh, to people at uh, USC to, to collaborate, so it's good to know what what do you, where do you want to go? What uh, are you missing to get there? Um, yeah, but, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to hear you uh, on that. Yeah, for sure, Professor. So, uh, uh, what uh, what I am planning is to actually uh, uh, work on uh, the training methodologies for uh, SNNs. Uh, so, I would like to actually uh, pick up my point from uh, from. Uh, uh, take my point uh, about the uh, answer I gave to Professor Biplup's uh, question about that can can uh, do all the NNs have SNN counterpart to it. So uh, what I have seen so far is that uh, majority of the architectures are NN inspired. So I want to uh, develop architectures which are which actually use uh, spiking neurons in their own uh, uh, in their own right and not uh, uh, inspired from the NN domain. So this is where uh, uh, I want to look into in the future. And that's why I, I reached out to, uh, to professors, to you and Professor Biplup to uh, sort of figure out, uh, to, to develop uh, biologically inspired architectures uh, for spiking networks. Because uh, I think as of now, the majority of the research which I have gone through is, is, is more like group work. Uh, it's, like, it's like an university group work where one person does the heavy lifting. And that one person in spiking networks case is the neuromorphic computing chip. So it's doing the heavy lifting for developing, uh, or sorry, uh, for, for, for imparting energy efficiency to SNNs. The architectures themselves are not bringing any energy efficiency. Uh, so I want to look into that, uh, that domain for the spiking architectures. Uh, Ramtin, uh, so, so, so we had, uh, we had, um... Uh, seminar, uh, a thesis seminar uh, not long ago. And um, there was a, so we discussed a topic on uh, of um, how some um, neural architecture like lateral inhibition could be exploited. I don't know, Ramtin, if you want us to discuss that or you prefer to keep that. <laughs> no, sure, yeah, we can, we can absolutely have a chat about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I was, I missed a part of the meeting, but I, I joined at the end. Uh, but I enjoyed the 
uh, enjoyed the talk anyways and I, and I appreciate that thank you uh, so maybe for me to I'm, I'm, I'm I know it's a bad thing to ask for but for me to just catch up a little bit so Ramesh you know do you have so you said that you have your own the method that you use for low heat is it based on conversion so far or you already have the training done okay. by yourself too okay so uh so far, my work on Lohihi has, uh, so, okay, so if I talk about deploying a network on Lohihi, then that is uh, mainly for the inference purposes. And uh, th that I have done through ANN to SNN conversion method, as well as through direct okay. training of uh, SNNs. But the training has not been done on Lohihi yet. No, I understand. So, so it's mostly yeah. how Lohihi used, right? So they, they, the way, <laughs> but what, what, if when you did the conversion, did you use a toolbox, a Sunon toolbox, or like Nengo, or what did you I, use? For the I used uh, Nengo DL uh, for the conversion, and I used Nengo Lohihi for the deployment on uh, neuromorphic hardware. Sorry, on, on Lohihi. As of now, I'm using uh, Lava, which is supported, uh, which, which is offers that's, support that's for what, Lohihi yeah. too. Exactly. So, that's what uh, they want us to use, right? So my yes, lab is correct. very active in this area too. And I, I happen to know Cindy very well as well. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so we had in several uh, co uh, conferences that we worked together and put together. And we are active in IRNRC as well. And we did some conversion. And, and we are also directing the lab towards more um, direct training mechanisms. And that's something that they kind of want to, like using a Slayer and so on. Yes, so that's... I, Mm -hmm. So, so what Slayer does, as as you might know, Professor, anyways, uh, that uh, it it doesn't still offer training on Lohihi. It's still an off chip training method using surrogate gradient descent. Uh, so, what I am uh, so, if we really talk about energy efficiency, then I think the training should be done on chip as well because this is because training is where majority of the energy consumption uh, goes. So. Uh, uh, for now, the Lohihi is in very nascent stage for offering uh, on-chip training. Uh, they, are, they are advertising three-factor learning rule. I am yet to explore how three-factor uh, rule-based training can be done. I have not found any tutorials specifically on three-factor uh, rule-based uh, training the way we do on uh, uh, like like in the software domain. So it's, I think it's quite you, still challenging. And that's true. Uh, I, I agree with that. I At the same time, I think the... So I'm not entirely sure that we want to use something low, like low here for training because so the way that we can think of it now a lot of neuromorphic devices can be considered as HA accelerators at best so so we don't really use a coral tpu for training as well right so we do the training offline the thing with slayer and this kind of surrogate gradient methods and all the other methods that they use slayer happens to be the most advanced one and the uh, so just a little bit of back story. I'm not sure you, you talked about it in the talk, but I think there are several ways that you can still do backprop on uh, neuromorphic system. I was actually teaching it yesterday in my class, literally the same topic. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are several ways that we can use, as you can know. One of them is surrogate gradient that you just remove it and replace it with sigmoid or something in the back prop, yeah. back uh, backward pass. And then there are mechanisms like... Uh, approximating a threshold function like a linear function or what this layer does is just kind of like a another kind of approximation of the uh, threshold function so so when we say this layer and surrogate gradient is pretty much a alternative for back props and some of them work pretty well so from my point of view if i want to i mean uh, my, this is my thought about this topic I don't think that we necessarily want to move it to Loihi to do the training and heavy lifting of the training, because we should think of it as an alternative for edge devices right now at this state. So yes. Loihi on data center, we're far from Loihi or any kind of neuromorphic chip for data center applications, which makes me think Slayer or these alternatives can be good because when we do conversion, we lose a lot of details, right? We lose a lot of uh, information right there and also the problem with conversion is the architecture is designed based on deep learning paradigms but when you use slayer you can design the architecture based on neuromorphic paradigms right that's good and, so, and then you just train it that way so i, I do think that there's a big space for uh, especially intel is 
pushing. I know you guys are, are part of INRC too, like internal morphic research committee. Yes. Uh, so they're pushing with the lava and using this kind of surrogate gradients and slayer methods. And I do think that there is a good path there to use backprop if you want to get backprop level accuracy. But just my two cents on top of that, I, I do think that something that can be very interesting is creating a platform that enables something like a neural architecture search. Uh, and then we use uh, kind of like brain kind of evolving of architecture. So we can get inspired by how brain evolves as neural architecture. And then we evolve it that way. And then you use some kind of um, local learning rules like SDDP that is brain-like, right? And see how it works. The problem with Intel, Loi, and this kind of architecture is that they're not even close to supporting this kind of thing, right? They're not even close to support. So that's, that's the issue right there. That, that's exactly uh, correct. Uh, so uh, I won't say that I'm defending Intel Lohihi. I'll just say that it's still the state of the art chip. And, and that's the best that we are getting in any neuromorphic chip available to researchers. That, uh, and uh, I agree that uh, such varied uh, uh, spiking architectures may not be supported on Lohihi uh, right now. Uh, when you're talking about neural architecture search, uh, in fact, one of the students in my lab, uh, he is he is working on uh, neural architecture search. I think he is using uh, the MGM uh, metric. Have you heard of that? MGM? MGM. Yes, yeah. MGM metric. Uh, so, so this paper was out from uh, Yale uh, University, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll see if, if, if I can get that. Uh, if we can get my hands on that paper and maybe forward to you because they are talking about uh, neural architecture search mm. and, and currently he's experimenting with it. But mm. that is, uh, as, as for his, uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, early experiments, uh, he, he, he mentions that it is, it is quite a uh, computationally intensive process to figure out uh, uh, a, a proper uh, like efficient uh, spiking architecture. Mm. Uh, I would also like to bring into this uh, 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 a method called uh, a neuro evolution of augmented topologies, uh, NEAT, if you have heard of that. So this is an evolutionary algorithm based. So, uh, but these are again, very computationally uh, intensive <laughs> methods to, yeah. to, to, to search for an architecture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Ramashish, I will connect, uh, if you're not connected, I will connect you to Ramatin and uh, Christian uh, after so, the okay. call. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you can follow up on the discussions. Yes. Uh, just being cognizant of everyone's time. I just want to check if there are any last minute questions. Okay. So thanks for the talk uh, and a very informative talk. Uh, Amit, any final words from your side? No, I think uh, uh, it's, it's thank you uh, certainly to Ram and to you for uh, you know finding this uh, gem of a uh, uh, you know uh, speaker uh, to my to our PhD students. Um, we look forward to you demonstrating this level of command on your research. Uh, and uh, as Ram, you saw probably comments, a uh, lot of people liked your talk already and commented on that. So fantastic job. Uh, we should, certainly should do more of this, but uh, this was a timely job. A lot of interest from us, um, you know, more than 30 people participated. So I'm delighted. Yeah, and, and you're welcome to come here anytime, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, visit or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Th th thank you so much, Professor Ramit and Professor Sivasta for hosting me. And uh, those were very kind words and very uh, encouraging words. Uh, I hope I stand true to all the words and all the appreciations. <laughs> thank you all so right. much. Thank you very much. Thank we you. need okay. more neuromorphs.